mTOR is an energy sensor and it's in all of our cells. The idea is you want to reduce mTOR as much as you can. The more you suppress it, the longer you live. And here's the reason. People that want to live longer uh, and be healthy while they live longer, not having to get surgeries all the time. Right. If you had three to five minutes max to talk to someone who said, I just want to live longer. I want to know the secrets to living longer. I got to figure out the keys and you've got three minutes with them. What would you say in three minutes are the things they must do every day or as often as they can for the rest of their life to extend their life? The first thing they must do is realize that the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. The only purpose of food and preferably it'll be mushrooms that you pour the, the olive oil on. Mm. That's number one. Uh, the evidence <clears throat> that the polyphenols in olive oil, if you really you know, wanted to live well uh, for a very long time, olive oil is the key. Two of the blue zones, actually three, if you count the Acheroles, use a liter of olive oil per week. Now, that's a lot of olive oil. Uh, it's sort of like 10 to 12 tablespoons a day. So there's a beautiful study out of Spain that I talk about where you took 65-year-old people. And we'll dumb it down real quick. Two groups. One group had to use a liter of olive oil per week for five years. Then they changed their olive oil once a week at the clinic. The other group had to eat a low-fat Mediterranean diet, mm -hmm. both Mediterranean diets of Spain. At the end of five years, the olive oil group had better memory, had improved memory than when they started. The low-fat group lost memory. The women in the olive oil group had a 67% less incidence of breast cancer than the low-fat group. People in both groups who had coronary artery disease, the group that got the olive oil had a 30% less incidence of new events versus the group that had the low-fat diet. Mm. And so if, you know, three blue zones and this study doesn't convince you that you better get olive oil into you, olive oil grows brain cells and it's not the oil wow. per se it's actually the polyphenols in olive oil olive oil the polyphenols literally make your blood vessels slippery and i've actually published data on this that your blood vessels you cannot stick cholesterol to blood vessels if you have olive oil in your system huh. yeah so you know drink the dumb stuff do you drink it? it yeah i do wow yeah, i take a shot of it. <laughs> craig's always talking about yeah. how he can drink as much as possible. But yeah. what I would urge people to do is, so you can cook an olive oil. This myth that olive oil oxidizes when you cook it is is one of the worst internet myths there is. Really? It turns out that olive oil is the least oxidizable oil. It's even better than avocado oil or coconut oil. It does not oxidize. Oxidize meaning like evaporate. No, I, I oxidize mean, mean gets damaged. Damaged, damaged. got damaged. it, okay. okay. It turns out everybody sees olive oil smoking and they figure that's damaged. Mm -hmm. it's, not. it's not. So you can burn it as much as you want. You know, cultures, have been, cultures have been using olive oil to cook with for 5,000 yeah, years. Yeah. And, you know, there's not a lot of dead Italians from cooking <laughs> in olive oil. Okay, so okay. you got to get so olive oil. So that's number one. Number one. Number two, you got to take vitamin D3. You got to vitamin D three, three. not D. Not, yeah. Well, there's there's D two, there's okay. D one. What's vitamin D three and why is it important? So D three is the active form of vitamin D that we use. You will be shocked that people who have the highest levels of vitamin D in their bloodstream live the longest and live well really? compared to people with the lowest levels of vitamin D three. It turns out that you have to have vitamin D3 to activate stem cells activation. And we can... <laughs> vitamin D is also through the sun, is that correct, correct? But it's nearly impossible to get enough vitamin D through the sun. <laughs> really? Nearly impossible. 80% of Southern Californians are vitamin D deficient because we're slathering sunscreen on us and we're wearing long uh -huh. sleeve shirts. We're inside protective. a lot still. We're inside yeah. a lot, you know... Uh, I live in Palm Springs. It's pretty hot in the summer. Really hot we tend there. not to go out a lot in the summer. So we don't have enough vitamin D. And so you have to swallow vitamin D. The University of California, San Diego, huh. published a study that the average human being to have an adequate level of vitamin D3 should be taking 9,600 international units a day. 
So basically 10,000 international units. Wow. They found no one who had vitamin D toxicity at 40,000 international units a day. You can't overdose on vitamin D. I have yet to see vitamin D toxicity. And I've been measuring vitamin D levels for 20 years wow. in patients every three months. I personally run my vitamin D level greater than 120 nanograms per milliliter for the last 12 years to prove I'm not dead. <laughs> and okay. so far, so good. Right. right? Yeah, yeah. And here's, you know, just you wow. know, to tell you how crazy this is. If I feel I'm getting something, if I'm coming down with a scratchy throat or something, I'll take 150,000 international units of vitamin D3. How many capsules is three that? Three days. Well, so you can get 5,000s, right? So okay. that's 10 <laughs> capsules three times a day for three days. So I'm basically taking a half a million international units of vitamin D to ward off a virus. Everyone always says you should take vitamin C when you start to feel like a scratch. Yeah, it really doesn't work. Vitamin D is probably <laughs> one of the best antivirals that's ever been discovered. So vitamin C really doesn't help that much? It really doesn't help that much. Even, I, I'll add, a, we can get into vitamin C, and I think wow. everybody should take a time-release vitamin C twice a day, and it's actually for a different purpose. What's the purpose? All right. <laughs> the quick version. All right, quick version. So you and I are one of the few animals that don't manufacture our own vitamin C. Uh, mm. Us, monkeys, and guinea pigs. And we have actually all the genes to manufacture vitamin C. There's actually five of them. The last gene is turned off. It's called a ghost gene. Well, why do we do that? Well, we manufacture vitamin C from sugar, from glucose. Mm -hmm. And it's actually very expensive to manufacture vitamin C. So the theory is, and I like the theory, is we grew up uh, in Africa with lots of vitamin C containing plants in our diet. And so it was unnecessary for us to manufacture vitamin C. And the theory goes, we'd have some extra glucose left over that we could store as fat mm. to make it through the winter when times are rough. And we're the only fat storing ape. So the problem is vitamin C is essential to repair collagen and everybody collagen. Okay. The reason smokers get wrinkles is mm. collagen is broken because you actually repair cracks in collagen with vitamin C and smokers use up all their vitamin C with uh, what's called oxidative stress. So they don't have any vitamin C. In fact, here's another controversial statement. If I've got a smoker with heart disease, uh -huh. I'm willing to trade him his smoking with him taking large amounts of vitamin C while I get the rest of his diet squared away rather than tell him to stop smoking. Wow. Now, the reason I say that is, and I talk about this in the book, there's this fascinating island people called the Katavans in New Guinea who smoke like fiends. They eat 60% of their diet is taro root. The other part of their diet is coconut oil. Hmm. And they live into their mid-90s with no medical care, but they've been studied ex extensively. There has never been a case of a heart attack, heart disease, or a stroke in these smokers. What they do do is they eat a lot of vitamin C containing fruits and vegetables as mm. part of their diet. Olive oil as well? They don't have any olive oil. They have coconut oil. That's their coconut oil. Yeah, they don't have really? any olives down there. So you can do without olive oil and still live a long life? Yeah. But, but you think olive oil will... Well, yeah, since olive oil is so readily available, you might as well. Might as well. Might as well. Okay, wow. so okay, anyhow, so, back to vitamin C. Yeah. You have to have vitamin C to repair the cracks in blood vessels. Uh, people remember scurvy, where people would die, they bleed to death on long ocean voyages. Mm. Actually, 50% mortality on those old ocean voyages, just dying from scurvy. And the British Navy, the reason they're called limeys is because the surgeon in the British Navy realized that if he gave them limes to take on the voyage, that they wouldn't die of mm. scurvy. And that's why the British Navy is still called limeys. Wow. So vitamin C repairs the cracks in collagen, and our blood vessels are flexing all the time. And so these cracks have to be repaired. And if they're not repaired, you basically bleed to death. We have a system of repairing those cracks, and it's called cholesterol. And cholesterol will patch those cracks. Interesting. So if you have plenty of vitamin C throughout the day, you won't 
you'll be able to repair those cracks. Wow. And there's a wild study. I mean, head down a rabbit hole. You can genetically engineer rats to lack that final gene to make vitamin C. And they will live half as long wow. as a normal rat. If you then put vitamin C in their water, they will live as long as a normal rat who can manufacture their vitamin C, but they're drinking the water throughout the day. Yeah. So vitamin C, unfortunately... We have to manufacture. We have to manufacture it, and yeah. we've got some interesting tricks to do that uh, coming up. Okay. But in the meantime, the average person should take like 1,000 milligrams of timed-release vitamin C twice a day Okay. to cover their ass. Wow. Okay. okay. So the first thing I heard you say, this three minutes is turning into 20. It's okay. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> the first thing I heard is olive oil. Oh, and olive oil is actually one of the tricks to activate the ghost gene, a polyphenol in olive oil. Okay. You will actually make vitamin C. <laughs> okay. There you go. So there you go. Another good reason. So have olive oil yeah. and vitamin D. Have lots of vitamin D. Three. D3. D3. And then what's next to okay. live a long life? Next is you got to get some form of long chain omega-3 fat, be better known as fish oil. Mm. And vegans have no excuse anymore. There is algae-based DHA and EPA. But here's the deal. Your brain uh, is about 70% fat. So if you want to call me a fathead, you know, I, I will You'll bat take you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I can just see now the internet uh, lighting up. <laughs> and memes. Is a fan. <laughs> fathead. <laughs> so half of the fat in your brain is actually an omega-3 fat called DHA. So half, basically half of your brain mm -hmm. is fish oil. Wow. And as I talk about in the longevity paradox, you look at people what are called the omega-3 index, which basically looks at how much DHA you have in you over the past two months. People with the highest omega-3 index have the largest brains and the largest areas of memory, the hippocampus. People with the lowest levels of DHA have the most shrunken brains and the smallest memory areas, hippocampus. Mm. So mom was right. When she said fish is brain food, you know, she was absolutely, she didn't know why it was, but we now know it's DHA is really what makes your brain. So sushi is good. Sushi is actually not a good idea. Oh, wow. Most of the people I see with high mercury levels are sushi eaters or dentists. Uh, so, and particularly huh. sashimi grade tuna. God, it's you so good, just though. wanna you just kind of so wanna good. stay away from it. Oh, sugar Sorry. fish is amazing though. Yeah, tono, and no. it's got the grains too. Yeah, it's got the fit. grains, you know. So, so no sushi. Yeah, so just, once in a while. Yeah, once in a while. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so fish oil is incredibly important. Yeah, and what I try to get people to do, and again, I measure this every three months in all my patients, and when we're talking, you know thousands and thousands of patients over the last 20 years you want to get about a thousand milligrams of dha per day now how do you do that well you get fish oil i mean you can go to costco i don't right, care. Right, right. and you look on the back and you find serving size and make sure it says one serving size uh -huh. they love to fool you uh, they may say two or three right, right, right. and then you look down below and you see dha and you look to see how much dha is in a capsule and you add it up and say, oh, okay, there's 250 milligrams of DHA in this capsule, so I need to take four. Wow. Four a day. Yeah. Or well, thousand I mean, a day. However. Thousand a day. Yeah. yeah. Thousand a day. Okay. DHA. We got olive oil. We got uh, vitamin D3. We have fish oils. What else do we need to live longer? So you got to have polyphenols in your diet. So poly what's what the polyphenol? heck is a polyphenol? How do you remember polyphenol? Th think about polyphenol. Okay. Um, phenols are plant compounds. Polyphenols are plant compounds that plants use primarily to protect themselves uh. against stress and sunlight. Uh -huh. uh, just interesting fact. We know that red wine is beneficial for you because of actually two polyphenols. The most famous is resveratrol. The other one is quercetin or quercetin. The higher the grapes are grown, the higher 
in altitude the grapes are grown, the more polyphenols they make. Because they need more to protect themselves. Yeah, right? exactly. It's basically uh, suntan. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they, they've actually protected themselves against sunburn. Interesting. Also, the more the plant is stressed, the more polyphenols it makes to protect itself. Right. Okay? So, polyphenols are traditionally in dark colored berries. So, for instance, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. Interesting fun fact, the leaves of these trees or vines have more polyphenols than the actual fruit does. Hmm. So, for instance, black raspberry leaves have far more polyphenols than black raspberries. Um, And I take black raspberry capsules, oh, by the way, and it's in the book. There you go. Um, So... Olives, for instance, are loaded with polyphenols, huh. and olives that are stressed uh, produce even better. are even better. Wow. Olive leaves have more polyphenols than olives, so olive leaf extract is an easy way of getting the huge amount of benefits without drinking a liter of olive oil. So do you, what about like, uh, you know, leafy greens? Do yeah. you want stressed out looking leafy greens or do you want healthy, thriving Excellent looking? Excellent question. It turns out that the reason organic vegetables in general are better for you, besides the fact that they haven't been sprayed with pesticides mm-hmm. and herbicides and probably Roundup, and we can get into that, is the fact that these Creatures, these plants, actually have to work harder, huh. and they have to produce more polyphenols to protect themselves against insect predation. And so that's actually the reason you want to eat organic. So when you're going to the farmer's market and the poor little organic vegetables have got pockholes of, of insects <laughs> it's like and, they're dying. and they don't look very good, you go, I want that guy. Really? That guy is struggling. He is going to just be so loaded with polyphenols. Really? And correlation with that is <laughs> the more bitter the better because polyphenols in general yeah. are very bitter uh, for instance when uh, we were developing you know my signature product vital reds it's pure polyphenols primarily mm. and they're bitter so we did lots of taste testing to figure out how the heck we're going to mask these mm. really bitter compounds so more bitter more better in fact, as I talk about it in the book, I, I had the pleasure of knowing Jack LaLanne, uh-huh. uh, who, who you would know is really the godfather of, yeah. of fitness and nutrition in the United States. And I knew him in his later years. Um, and Jack used to have a saying is that if it tastes good, spit it out. Interesting. Now, what he really meant by that is bitter things, nasty tasting things is actually what is going to give the bugs that are actually going to keep you alive what they want to eat. And don't, you know, more bitter, more better. Mm. So, you know, the more polyphenols, the more bitter greens I can get into you, the, the better. better. Interesting. But you can get that through capsules and other things too. You don't yeah, to, you can. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the reasons I'm a nut about taking a bunch of supplements because yeah. We, if you look at even you know, really good organic eaters, most human beings only eat maybe 20 different plant species. Mm-hmm. Um, I, are, probably, I probably eat like three. Yeah, yeah. yeah most people do. <laughs> like five, maybe. Yeah, it's like, you know, and, and you know, ketchup is not a vegetable. <laughs> exactly. It's a tomato, and we can't, <laughs> we can't, we, do, we that, can't yeah. do that. So our an- our ancestors, and even looking at modern hunter gatherers like the Hansa tribe, they go through. They eat. 250 different plant species on a rotating mm. basis. And you think about it, all those plants are grown organically. Uh, they're in six feet of loam soil. They got their cool microbiome. So they're just replete with all these nutrients and polyphenols. And so, you know, if people think that they can actually do a great job eating healthy uh, without supplementation, mm. uh, I got oceanfront property in Palm Springs. I'm happy to sell them. Right, right. Hey, exactly. yeah, there is no. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> okay, so I want to get one more thing. I've heard that in order to extend your life, you need to. I can't remember the name. Extend something at the end of your telomeres. Telomeres. Yeah. What is or that? Or telomeres. Telomeres. So how do we, is that true? Do you have to extend this? Okay, so that is one theory of longevity. And it it is a, it's a good theory. I like the theory. Uh It's controversial. Um, 
vitamin D. Turns out that people with the highest levels of vitamin D have the longest telomeres. There you go. So why wouldn't you do that right. if you like that theory? Mm-hmm. There you go. So that's vitamin D is vitamin D. It, it's if that's anybody is if anybody takes away it's vitamin D. So you've given four things so far. Let's give me one final thing that can extend our life and the the quality of our life as well. Great. So the last thing we want to do is we want to turn off as much as we can the sensor called mTOR. Uh, originally called the mammalian target of rapamycin. Uh, it's subsequently been discovered in all organisms besides mm. mammals. And so now it's called the mechanistic target of rapamycin. And so mTOR is an energy sensor and it's in all of our cells. And basically, we come from a circadian rhythm mm-hmm. system of plentiful food at one time of the year and very little food at right. another time of year. Right. Fruit sometimes, not the Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> and we use fruit to gain weight for the winter, and that's a whole other subject. So mTOR senses energy availability, and it senses sugar molecules, and it also senses amino acids, protein. Now, it turns out that it's very sensitive to particular amino acids Mm -hmm. rather than all amino acids. The ones it's most sensitive to are amino acids contained in animal protein. And animals include fish. Animal protein includes eggs. It includes cheeses and besides, you know, meat. So beautiful work that's been done, a lot of it done by now my friend, Walter Longo from USC, from the Longevity mm. Center. Is that the mimicking yeah, fasting the, the diet? Yeah, the fasting mimicking diet. Yeah, I've taken that a couple yeah, of times. And I, you know, that he got a patent for yeah. Prolong. Yeah, Prolong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He got a patent for it. So Prolong, this. yeah. It's so good. Prolong is a vegan, low amino acid diet that you do for five days yeah it's tough the first time it is for me it was. now in the book i wrote about it in the plant paradox actually before he made problem but i write about it again and he and i and he's even given me a nice shout out on the back um uh, if you the idea is you want to reduce mTOR as much as you can and the longer the more you suppress it the longer you live and here's the reason mm-hmm. you if times are rough and you sense that times are rough, your body, your immune system, actually goes around and looks at all the cells in your body and says, who's pulling their weight? Who is really you know, contributing to this effort? And who's a slacker? Who looks a little weird? Who's not, you know, not doing? And it actually instructs cells to commit suicide. And it's called autophagy. And it tells cells, sorry, you know, you're not, die. You're, out, you're out of here, yeah. you die. Um, <laughs> and so it gets the fittest of the fittest mm-hmm. to survive. It makes you stronger. And you have to have these periods of time. You have to call the herd, as we say. So unless you do that, you have all of these cells that just kind of build up the debris. They're called senescent cells. Mm-hmm. Some people call them zombie cells. And it's the amount of these zombie cells that is actually going to make you deteriorate long before you should. It gets so, sick and everything yeah, else. Exactly. Yeah. So you got to call the hurt. So how you do that? Five days in a row, once a month. Once you, a month you do this? Once a month. Five days wow. in a row. Five days in a row. You follow uh, a, ve- mimic, the- a vegan diet mm-hmm. of about 900 calories. Mm-hmm. And I've got some great recipes. It's easy to do. And you do it five days in a row. Yep. It's as if you did calorie restriction every day. And what this does is not only call the herd, but it activates stem cells. Now, everybody says, oh, stem cells, you know, it's the future. You've got oodles of stem cells in you already. Mm -hmm. Where do you think we get the stem cells? We, you know, take a liposuction and suck out your fat, and then we spin it around, we get your stem cells and inject you right back in. They're already there. How much does alcohol, smoking, or marijuana, or psychedelics actually affect lifespan? Do we have enough research on this yet, or? Uh... Well, we do on, on tobacco smoking. There's obviously, yeah. it's very clear that's a decade off your life. 
And what's interesting is that what we're learning about these various things that you can do to hurt yourself or to protect yourself is that what's happening is that your body is aging at a different rate. So smokers, you can measure it, are older biologically than people who've never smoked. And it's why they look older too. Wow. We yeah. can measure that now. In my lab, if I took your blood, I could tell you how old you are biologically, not just your chronological I want to do that. I saw you post this on Instagram that you're like 46. Is that right? Or you're 42 uh, just, or what is it? I went down to, what was it, 44, I think. Okay, or 42. 44. It, it yeah. bounces around, but it's usually a decade younger than That's I thought cool. I actually. That's so, cool. So what do you do? You take a blood sample, like, and yeah. then you what? So measure the, the blood? There's two ways of doing it. Uh, there's one company that I advise called Inside Tracker, and that's what I use. I've often. had that too. Yeah, you've done that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they come to your home, or you, you donate, and, and then you get this uh, this readout of, I think it's 40 different parameters, mm-hmm. and they use an algorithm and tell you how old you are. So I'm 42 or something like that. I'm on the I'm in the top two percent of people from my age for youthfulness. So no, I'm, no, I'm happy with just that. Just dust it off, a little brag over there. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you better be if you're researching this. And the top scientists in the world on this. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I don't like to brag. That's not what Australians right. and scientists do. <laughs> but what I, I, I do want to say is I use my body as a, an experiment. Yeah. And try to be a role model. Mm-hmm. And I've been optimizing my lifestyle for 20 years now mm-hmm. based on this be- feedback from Inside Tracker for the last 12, 13 years. Wow. And you can see the graphs of things going out of the optimal zone. And then I make a change based on science and it comes back or even better. So we know from smokers that their biological age is older when they smoke, is what you're saying, right? Yeah, well that's one test. The inside tracker test is what I do routinely every few months. But there's a new type of test that my colleagues um, and in, in my lab we've developed. It's called the DNA methylation test. It's also known as the Horvath test, named after my friend Stephen Horvath at UCLA. The way to think of this is, if you've ever heard of the epigenome, uh uh-huh, I've heard of that. These are the, the control systems that control our DNA. It turns out that that system you can measure. Uh, It's chemicals on your DNA that change over time predictably. And we've just developed a way to measure that 100 times cheaper than it was before. Mm. And uh, I'm going to bring this test to the public so that people can test their biological age. At home or something? It should be a cheek swab. That's what we're developing. So you don't have to prick or take blood or anything. You do a cheek swab. Exactly. And then you ship it in or something? Yeah, you'll post it in. And then you get, hopefully just a week later or less, Here's your credit score for your body. Well, that's cool. And then even better, here's how do you how do you slow it down or reverse it based on everything we know about you. Wow, that's and we'll, cool. We'll take you on that journey. So do this, eat this, swallow this. That is cool. I gotta take that test. Yeah. Well, you can get on the wait list if you want. Okay. Uh, where, where there, there's go? a website because we, we are uh, taking names right now. We may do some studies with early adopters too. That's cool. What's uh, where's the so wait list? So it's for called that? Tally. T A L L Y, tallyhealth.com. And uh, the reason I'm excited about it is it's very hard to focus on what works because we have no idea. You exercise, you hope that it's good. Yeah. Is it too much, too little? If I eat this, does it help me? Uh, we need a dashboard for our bodies, and that's what that's what these give you. That is really cool. Okay, so we know that smoking makes you age biologically. That's why it makes you look older. Smoking. What about drinking alcohol? You know, we've talked about wine and the, the, the substance in wine that could be supportive, but alcohol in general, does that affect biological age and aging? Well, it's all, it all depends on quantity. Gotcha. Uh, one glass a day, most doctors would say, especially if it's red wine, it's fine. And the alcohol actually can help with cut the cardiovascular system, hmm. reduces uh, bad cholesterol, and more importantly, raises the, the good cholesterol, HDL. This is for red wine. Uh, and the alcohol in white wine does a little bit of good too. Okay. But, but beer. So beer will raise the levels of uric acid, which is a breakdown product of uh, a protein breakdown product mm. that you can pee out. Um, but if you have too much beer and other types of food that contain a lot of this type of protein, you will raise your uric acid level. So why does that matter? Mm-hmm. It's being becoming very clear that if you have high uric acid levels, your body will age faster. We just had uh, Dr. David Perlmutter on, exactly. who has a book about uric acid, talking yeah. about like this is one of the the root causes of poor health yeah. and aging faster and things like that. So well, al- alcohol, talk you talked to him a lot. Yeah, yeah. I actually was, was uh, one of the first people to read his book before it came out. Yeah, it's really I, good. It, it blew my mind. Uh, yeah. I now measure my uric acid levels. You can get 
little test strips. Uh, you can just buy them on the usual. You just pee on it. No, you, it? You, you, you spit it? on it, and ten <laughs> seconds later, you see you see your levels. acid levels. Yeah. And so the the lower the level, the better. Right. The higher the level means there's risk for what? Everything, according to David, it's really bad for cancers and heart disease mainly. But uh, I, I think he's right that it's a, it's a sign of of accelerated aging. The higher the uric level, the faster you're going to be aging. Yeah. And a larger con- amount of consumption of alcohol, specifically beer, I'm hearing, raises that level. Beer in particular has beer a particular. lot of the chemicals in it that will raise uric acid, unfortunately. And, th- and that's from David Perlmutter. He gave me a list of foods. And I saw so beer on there. Like, no, oh, that's awesome. now is. Is there any benefit to beer in biology, in science? Does it help you improve the quality of your health? Your, is your brain get better? Does your, your body, your system get better? Does it make you younger at all? Or are there no benefits to beer biologically and in your brain? There are benefits because there's alcohol in there, and a little bit of alcohol is good for your cardiovascular system. But, but there's other things that's good for your cardiovascular system for sure. too, right? That you yeah. don't that you don't need. That. So beer on the on the list of alcohols is at the bottom for health, Got uh, it. mostly, unless it's full of sugar. Uh, you know, like those very sweet wines, I think would be a problem. But beer does have a lot of vitamin uh, B, B group vitamins, B three, tons of it. But uh, you can get that good. in other ways too. You can. <laughs> so what can you do? I mean, you got to live as well. Right, right. I, I, I don't it. prescribe yes. a life that's that's prolonging and feels longer. You've know, you uh, got to live a little. Right, right. Enjoyment. The enjoyment yeah. of the richness of life. Yeah. Right. Though I am trying not to drink alcohol these days. Uh, I've never been drunk in my life. Yeah, amazing. Never been drunk. I don't find it amazing because I just never found the, 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 the des- I never had the desire to do it. I never, saw, I like tasted some when I was 16 and I was like, I don't understand why I would ever drink this. Plus it was also for me, maybe that's one of the reasons in your mind, I look younger, I look like I haven't aged more, is because I found it as a an advantage in sports when everyone else was drinking, I was like, oh, it's weakening their immune system, it's making them slower mm-hmm. mentally, this will give me an edge in athletics. They were hung over after games in practice and I was like, I'm gonna be sharp. And so I just kept on with it. I was like, this is just going to make me sharper. Mm. Now, I have my other vice. I use you know, sugar in other ways. This is my vice. So yeah, yeah. I'm not perfect. But um, does alcohol make you look older too? In excess. In yeah. excess, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So a little bit every day is, is okay. A little bit. But little most bit. doctors, um, like physicians, would say if you overdo it, you, you will age. And actually what, what you do as a researcher is you look at people who live a long time and compare them to either their twin, which has been done, or Ooh. family members. Interesting. Yeah, and actually how you live your life has a massive impact on how long you live. There's a twin study. They took identical twins, genetically identical, uh, in Denmark, and they said, okay, let's look at them through their life. And there were massive differences in how they looked and how, they, how long they lived. And when they went back to see what the causes were, they could figure out, First of all, that 80% of their lifespan was determined by how they lived, not their genetics. You mean the way they felt about themselves, the people they hung out with, their environment, the activities they took on, or what do you mean? Well, mostly their lifestyle, what they ate, did okay. they smoke, did they drink, did they exercise. Those did the they sleep things. well, all that stuff. Right. right. Okay. And those that did all the good things, the same genetics, twins, born the same day, one could live 10 years longer than the other. Now, this is what I'm curious about. Were these twins hanging out all the time? Or were they, because usually when you're hanging out with someone all the time, you pick up the similar habits, right? You pick up a similar lifestyle habit as your parents, as your partner, and you kind of eat the same things. It's really hard to be like, I'm going to drink every day and I'm not going to drink every day if you're living together and in the same room, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So I wonder that, how that is. Yeah. Maybe they, they got separated at birth or something. Interesting. Uh, but it does tell you a lot. The, the fact that 80% of our future health is in our own hands is, is liberating. That's really cool. Because often we think, ah, oh, it's not going to make a big difference. It really makes a big difference how you live your life every day. Focus on that. And one thing that I do is I look at my future self and I ask myself, what's that guy saying to me today if he could speak to me? What's he saying? Please don't eat that. Exactly. Please right? don't drink that anymore. You had enough. Like, you're going to hurt me in 10 yes, years. Yes, that's how you need to think about it. It's coaching yourself 10, 20, 30 years out. Right. It's interesting. I asked David Perlmutter, I said, what are some things you wish you would have done young, uh, sooner? 
to improve the quality of your health. And he was like, flossing. He was like, he's like, I, and I didn't, I didn't go deeper into that, but I remember him saying that. And I was like, there's wisdom in whatever it is. Maybe he had some gum issues or something he had to deal with at one point that was really affecting him for a year or two. I don't know. I'm just making this up. But if he could go back, he'd be like, I wish you would have done this better. So I didn't have to suffer later. Right? Yeah. What are the things you've done or you're doing now that your 10-year-old self will be so happy for? Like if he was in front of you right now, he'd just be hugging you and high-fiving you nonstop. The things you're doing that he will appreciate in 10 years. And then what are a few things that he's going to say, man, I really wish you wouldn't do that right now. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So um, let's see. So I'm... So I, I measure myself so I can speak scientifically, not just that mm-hmm. it makes me feel good. Uh, it's the, the one meal, one main meal a day. He would be grateful for. I'm sure of it. And, and as a result, I'm leaner and, uh, you know, more ripped. Uh, I hate you to look, say that word. You look lean. I am lean. You look really lean. Uh, I've You're gone shredded. over the last two years from 150 pounds to 133. Yeah, you look leaner even from when I, the first time I had you on. Your face is leaner and chiseled. Yeah, I've, I don't think I can lose any. I want to lose any more. Yeah, I, mean, I need to go back to the gym and do a little yeah. bit more. Um, so the one meal a day, but you weren't doing one meal a day, what five ten years ago? No, I only started during the pandemic. Um, yeah, this is new for me too. It's hard actually when you begin. Very hard. You feel hungry because you've got those crashes that make you really hungry, and you've got this and, um, hormone called ghrelin that makes you hungry. But once you get through that, it takes about three weeks. Mm-hmm. So anyone who who tries it, make sure that you don't give up early, just power through, and then mm. you, your liver will wake up. One main meal a day. So that's one. Um, the other thing I, I think that he will be happy is don't eat sugary foods. Oh, man. Yeah. Don't, don't eat that cake. Mm. So at, at a restaurant, when they said you want dessert, I always say no, but then I'm hoping that someone at the table that orders what bite. I want. <laughs> yeah, I, that's all, but that's all, you, all I need. Right. I need to taste right. it. I don't right. need to fill myself with a cake. Gotcha. Um, Because you still want to enjoy your life and live a full life, but you don't want to, in 10 years, be like, why do they eat cake every day? It's not worth it. Yeah. Really. Uh, Your future self will thank you for it. Mm. Um, Lifting weights. I know you do that. So I need to do more of that. I I got a standing desk. uh, So most of the day I'm standing, which is great. Again, you have to get used to it. You'll feel tired for the first few weeks. Yes. Uh, Your legs will. Uh, I'm now mostly focused on eating plants. I mean, mm-hmm. When did I you start that, that? That's recently. Uh, eating mostly plants. Yeah, I've switched. I, I love meat. I wish that I could eat more. But you just got to look at the science. There's some really good studies of thousands of people who just look at how long people live and what they eat. And I mean, it's not even an argument. But there's so many people that bring in the argument, well, all these people have cured these diseases or whatever, you know, gotten rid of these things from meat only and but people make the argument, right? Like you see it online, people making the argument for meat, meat, meat. So how, where are they finding these research studies of people living longer on an only meat diet? Uh, I don't know. I don't but know. you're not seeing them. You're not seeing studies of anyone that lives over 100 that all they do is eat meat. Well, there might be one person or two, but right, right. when you look at 10,000 people, what they eat, it's, uh, it's the vegan and, and the pescatarian that win out. In the blue zones, right. Yeah, and, and the, the numbers are something like that. You, you drop it down to, you've got 88% less chance, or actually it's, it's 12% chance for most diseases. So most diseases are protected by these diets. Really? Wait a minute, 88% less chance of what? Uh, of dying at any one point in the age range of the study, which, oh, wow. which is, uh, you know, like by, by, eat, by being a pescatarian. Yeah. Yeah. So it's vegan, pescatarian, those are the best. Then above that would be, um, actually, pescatarian was better than vegetarian. A little bit of meat seemed to help, but it has to be fish. Mm-hmm. And With then, the omega-3s in there, right? Yeah. And, and particularly, uh, oleic acid's good, which is found in avocados and olive oil. Uh, that activates one of the protective enzymes that we study in the lab. Which acid? Oleic, O-L-E-I-C. What is some of that, but not a lot of it's that? It's a right? monounsaturated fatty acid or MUFA. Uh, if you have a bit of olive oil, um, there's a supplement online that I get that has high levels of oleic acid in it that I take every day. Okay, cool. With the DHA and EPA. Yeah, all that stuff, yeah. All that good stuff. Yes, okay. Uh, so that's my, that's my fish intake is a pill. You don't eat fish, or you eat very little? 
Well, you know, I'm evolving my, mm -hmm. my diet. So I've, I've, I've gone from a Mediterranean diet over the last 10 years to the last two, three months to all plant-based, wow. no dairy, and yeah, no meat. And I'm just seeing what happens to my body. I'm measuring things. It's an experiment. Yes. It's not a philosophy. And if things don't work out biologically, go I'll go back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd love to go back to a state. I'm Australian after all. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I'm, I'm driven by science, and that's all yeah. that is. Yeah. Okay, so you got these four. Is there another thing that your future self would thank you for? One meal a day. Don't eat sugary foods. That's going to be the, one of the most challenging for me. Lifting weights, eating mostly plants. Was there anything else? Get control over psychological stress. Oh, yeah. Why is this so important? Well, the, the main problem is you have high levels of cortisol when you're stressed out psychologically. And it, it's clear that people who have high levels of, really high levels of stress are, are chronically ill. Mm. And even it accelerates gray hair. That's actually a fact. It's not just a myth. You really are getting older if you have stress. Really? So this yeah. scientifically proven that if you're stressed out all the time or more frequently, you're going to get older biologically. Correct. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, Can and, you and reverse you're... gray hair without uh, you... dyes? Uh, yes. Really? Well, not routinely, but there are examples of that. Um, there are... Uh, some drugs that have shown in the clinic that, that make hair go gray uh, from gray to brown. The, the the best example I can tell you is that that when people are stressed out, let's say they're in they're in the banking world and they're they're losing their minds, um, you can find hairs that start to turn gray. Okay, so you look at them and they're a little bit gray at the bottom. Oh, good, I'm turning gray. Okay, then they get given a vacation and they go away for a couple of weeks. And guess what happens to the hair shaft? It gets brown. It's brown again. Come on. You can find these gray-brown segments of hair in people. Yeah. And what they, they tracked it down huh. to was that the cells that make the hair pigment start to shut down, but they can be reinvigorated. But I suspect once you've been gray for a number of years, it's really hard to It's hard to, to reverse that, yeah. Yeah. So but, but, you know, I'm, I'm the first person to say aging is, is not unidirectional. In my lab, we're driving it forwards and backwards at will. It's not That's really difficult anymore once you figure it out. I had a protein shake because I went to this friend of mine's uh, company called Essential Foods, Living Foods, and he had this, uh, it was like a hemp, uh, coconut, mm. chia, moringa, like coconut cream, like mm. protein Sounds powder amazing. with lots of, yeah. And I had a couple of that uh, with a spoon of coconut butter for fat mm -hmm. and almond butter for fat. And, uh, and blended that up. That was my breakfast. And then lunch was um, had a big salad with lots of avocado, olive oil, and some wild salmon, which has fat. So that was – and dinner I haven't had yet. So yeah, cool. Awesome. <laughs> and dinner I'll usually have, you know, a small piece of protein. And, like, I'll, I, I'll put 75% of my vegetable plate as vegetables. Really? So if I go out to eat, I'll order, like, three sides of vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. And, and if, if you look at your plate, you know, by, by volume, 70 or 80% of your diet should be – plant foods mm -hmm. and non-starchy veggies right not potatoes and right and right and by and by um calories it should be like 50 to 60 percent fat because mm -hmm. but fat doesn't take up a lot of space so you can get a lot of calories and a little space and still eat like if you put a lot of olive oil in your thing or sure, eat coconut sure. butter so you don't have to worry about it you just have to eat and that, you know the, the trick is i don't worry about how much i eat i just worry about what i eat mm -hmm. and i make sure i have Stuff like I, I know that I'm going to be like here and I know how long it's going to be, so I always bring stuff Ooh. in my it's pocket. Like almond butter. Almond butter. Oh, so I just have nice. a pocket. I know I'm never going to be in a food emergency, so sure. I'm not, not going to have to eat something crappy. And I, 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 I think you know, I eat very little grains, very little beans. I do eat them. Yeah. I eat mostly vegetables and f some low glycemic fruit, and I eat lots of nuts and seeds, and I eat you know, good quality fish and, 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 and animal protein. What's low glycemic fruit? What does that include? So I'm not eating like tons of pineapple and grapes and, you know, like those are sugary things. Gotcha. And I eat like berries and uh, and I eat, you know, um, lot, mostly berries. And then okay. like I'll eat like an apples or pears sometimes okay, or kiwis cool. or grapefruit or mangoes or papaya, things like that. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so let's go back to functional medicine. Yeah, yeah. What does that actually mean? So functional medicine is, is compared to regular medicine. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, my, I don't know if people listening really have a great understanding of sure. like what's happening right now in science, but uh -huh. it's profound that the shift that's happening in our understanding of the body is it's like Columbus going, "Hey, the Earth isn't flat." 
Wow. And uh, right now, the last right, few years, it's just like the last decade or two. Okay. With our understanding of the human genome, of systems biology, of the body as a biological network, mm-hmm. as a system, it's like an ecosystem where everything's connected, working together, and so the way we organize medicine is according to these organs. You know, you've got your cardiovascular system, your neurologic system, your GI system, your, you know, and so you go to all these specialists, right? right? And, and, and everybody cheats your, their part of your body. If you have a migraine, we're actually learning that it might be related to gut flora. But, wow. Or if you have heart attack, I mean, now we know that you're, you might be getting cancer because of your gut bacteria. Well, no oncologist is asking you what's going on in your gut microbiome. Right. And so now we know, for example, like the microbiome is a great example of this disruption that's happening in healthcare. You know, the microbiome, which is your gut flora, it's really, it's like uh, 10 times as many cells as your own cells. It's 100 times as much DNA as your own DNA. Huh. So I, we're kind of lazy. We have about as much DNA as an earthworm. Okay. <laughs> but we borrow the DNA of the microbes, the microbes in our gut to do things for us. And we, 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 Borrow things from plants to do things from us, like, like for mm. example, glucosinolates. And so the, the microbiome is this huge thing that's got two to three million genes. We only have 20,000 genes. And it regulates wow. your weight. You can swap out poop from a thin person into someone with diabetes and reverse it. Right? Wow. Amazing. We've seen, we've seen people. I've heard stories of fecal transplants not only curing things like that, but like, you know, autoimmune diseases and Really? Parkinson's and people with MS and like crazy stories that I'm starting to hear. In the, and there's re- research now going on aggressively in looking at fecal transplants for all sorts of diseases. It's transferring poop from one person to another. Yes. What is that? How do you do that? Well, <laughs> What's that mean, process? Well, they collect the poop. There's actually a... a, a oh, I've never actually, heard of this. Yeah. You've never heard of this? I've never heard of this. Oh, my God. This is huge. So so the... Uh, what it, is it called? Fecal transplant. Okay. FMT, fecal microbial transplant. The way it came about was uh, some doctor had a bright idea that there was this condition called C. diff, which is an infection of the intestines that happens after antibiotics, is life-threatening, uh, and there's a huge amount of people are now resistant to antibiotics because of all the antibiotics in our mm. feed and our, in the animal production. So there's the drugs don't work. People die. Wow. And it, and. Somebody thought, well, gee, if I put the poop from a healthy person into a sick person, let's see what happens. And the doctor did it, and the person was cured like that. Shut up. 98% effective. 98% effective. So how do you do this? I so, understand this process. You want to get into it? <laughs> <laughs> Give me well, the 10 We can do the visual. So, <laughs> yes. so basically, they take, like, they take a, a fecal trans, uh, transplant specimen, like a, a donor specimen from a healthy person. And they screen them for all sorts of diseases. And then they spin it up with some saline. And then they inject it in with a Straight catheter up. or a, a colonoscope. And then it, they're actually also it like shit. It just heals inside? Or what's it do? When it's well, it goes in. It's like, it's like massive probiotics, right? Oh, interesting. Right? Yeah. And so it's like an infusion of infusion probiotics. Infusion of probiotics. And also there are actually pills now. They actually are making poop special pills. encapsulated no. poop pills. <laughs> poop pills. And it's not, I mean, this is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm not talking about like stuff that's oh wacky. I'm talking about serious medicine that people are doing. But it's not just for that. Now they're looking at it for all sorts of things. So and people are cured right after one infusion. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. So functional medicine is it's really nuts. understanding the, the body as a system and network and understanding that, that, that the focus should not be on treating disease but on creating health. So it's mm. the science of creating health. It's the ultimate biohacking tool. You know, and it's interpreting all the data and the stories from your body that it tells through uh, testing we do. For example, you don't have to do testing, but you can look into the body and look at your immune function and allergies and your gut flora and toxins and nutritional status. It's like doing a soil sample. So I'm like a soil farmer, mm. organic soil farmer, rather than an industrial agriculturist. I don't put all these chemicals on my plants to make them better, like herbicides and pesticides. I, I create a healthy soil, yeah. and then the disease doesn't occur, right? You just Disease can't land in a healthy soil. Right. So that's exactly what functional medicine is. We, we, we help people get in balance. We take away the things that cause imbalance. We put in the things that help create balance. So, for example, I had a woman come. She had a whole list of problems. That's why I call myself a holistic doctor because I take care of people with a, a whole list. list of problems. <laughs> so she had like psoriatic arthritis, was on a drug that cost 30 grand. Oh, my gosh. Called Stelera. And still was miserable. She also was overweight, had prediabetes, migraines, sinus problems, irritable bowel, reflux, depression, insomnia. She had like this whole list of things. Of course, she saw all these specialists, the sinus doctor, the migraine doctor, right. the autoimmune doctor, the skin doctor, the depression doctor, the gut doctor. Like, and, you know, everybody's <laughs> treating her with their best uh, practices. Drug, their best drug, probably. But, I mean, she's being seen at a top medical center. Yeah. Right? 
they're not doing bad medicine. They're doing standard of care. In fact, they're doing excellent standard of care. Right. But the standard of care is not the way we're going to fix these problems. It's outdated or it's not. It's, not, it's totally outdated. Mm. So rather than uh, thinking about how all these were separate, I said, how are these all connected? Interesting. Right? How are these all connected? And so there were connections. It was all inflammatory. And I said, well, why don't we put you on an anti-inflammatory low glycemic diet, a pegan diet, basically. Right. Took away an, a, anti a, allergens, and I and I cleaned out her gut because her gut was causing huge symptoms of bloating, and she had yeast reactions. She had like vaginal yeast oh. and anal yeast and itching and itchy ears and yeast everywhere. From the yeast on her mouth and thrush. Oh. And so I gave her an antifungal. I gave her stuff to clear out the bad bugs in her gut. I put in good bugs. I put in enzymes. I put in things to heal in gut, the gut lining. I gave her fish oil, vitamin D, just some basic stuff, probiotics. Yeah, but it was really eliminating the, eliminating the, the bad foods, eliminating the bad bugs in her gut, and putting, putting in, in new bugs, and putting in nutrients to help her body heal. Two months later, she comes back completely symptom-free. No way. No more arthritis. No more no more $230,000 drug. No more skin psoriasis. No migraines, no sinus problems, no irritable bowel, no reflux, no depression, no insomnia, and she lost twenty pounds. It was right? all from food. Totally. And what was food and her gut flora? Right. I focused on her gut flora. Why? Because sixty percent or fifty percent of the immune system is in the gut. Interesting. Yeah. Why? Why is it in the gut? Why is it there? Because the, you're sticking pounds of food, of foreign material, every day in your body. It's got to fight it off in your gut. First, yeah. You right? and you've got, you know, you've got all that. Big bugs in there and poop. Right. It's like it's like a danger zone, right? It's like you're you're like right. and it's one cell away. Like you're one cell away from a sewer every minute. Really? Yeah, it's one cell between you and that mass of food and poop, right? So your immune system is like if anything happens, like right there. Wow. So when people have autoimmune disease, it's often a gut issue. It's wow. often a gut issue. People didn't know this before, did they? No, no. So now, like now, all this is really coming to light, and functional medicine is the operating system. To interpret the data, it's a new set of lenses to think about how to solve it, and it's mm-hmm. a, a system of treatment that helps people get back in balance. Gotcha. That's what's powerful. And then at Cleveland Clinic, you know, the CEO of Cleveland Clinic, Toby Cosgrove, I call him the Wayne Gretzky of healthcare. He goes where the puck's going to be, not where it is. Smart. Right? And he basically came after me to go set up a center there. And I'm Functional like, medicine center. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not going to Cleveland Clinic. It's like a... You know, it's like <laughs> I'm not going to go to a place where I'm going to have to bang my head against the wall, where it's traditional medicine, mm-hmm. where they don't get this, where they're in the dark ages. I just well, it's no- also in one, known as one of the top hospitals. In of the, course, in the but world, it's the right? top hospital in the old model. Yes. Right? So Correct. I'm like, but he know he knows what's he happening. Sees where it's going. He knows what's happening. He's like, we need this here. Wow. And so he's investing tons of money, millions and millions of dollars, building this. We're building an 18,000 square foot facility we started with a little space and we just outgrew it we're hiring doctors i have an interview with the doctor right after this and we're we're basically growing we're doing research in all sorts of conditions we're changing medical school education we're changing policy we're doing community work amazing so we're really he's really putting us on the map in the traditional world and and because he's gonna go out of business if he doesn't start doing this and but what's amazing to me you know uh lewis i thought when i got there people would be you know skeptical uh, negative, uh, make it difficult for me and my team there, but it's the opposite. Uh, huh. And I, at last, they want to learn. Last week interested. when I was there, I had two deans of medical schools, two chairs of depart, two chairs of institutes, which are like big deals, right. and another doctor as patients. No way. Yeah, they're coming as patients because they're not being cured with the medicine. The they're... executive team, the C-suite team, uh, is sending all their family members to come see us. Do you know Dr. Uh, Lisa Rankin by any chance? Yeah. She, she's she been on as well, and she talked about how she had all this medication. She was yeah. treating herself and yeah. then yeah. started saying, oh, let me just change the way I eat and yeah. my relationships and yeah. my emotional health. Exactly. It's all. And she's it's like, all, oh, I got off all the medicine. That's right. And then I stopped giving medicine to my patients. Right. I started asking so them deeper powerful. questions. It's so powerful. So we're we're at this we're but we're at this fulcrum. It's not it's not, it's not just I'm like one lone doctor with a crazy idea. There's a whole movement yeah, going yeah. on here. Yeah. And we had dinner with James Maskell. He's helping move that movement forward. I'm the chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine, where we train doctors all over the world in wow. this model and operating system of how to actually do this in practice. So we are we are literally building an army of, of doctors to change healthcare, and mm. and it's pretty exciting. And it's it's actually starting to really hit that hockey stick point where it's changing. Amazing. People want it. I mean, people are desperate for this model. So if someone is listening and they're on some type of medication or they're just feeling like constantly sick, you mm-hmm. know, something's mm-hmm. constantly mm-hmm. happening to them, 
What do you think is because you know, there's so much information online that it's so scary. It's scary, right? You know, well, here's what I would say: stuff, just like looking yeah. up anything yeah. and googling it and seeing all the nasty photos of, and just be like, ah, oh, yeah. What right. is an approach that someone should take if they have some challenge that's constantly happening in their health? Should they first analyze the food they're intaking and mm-hmm. do like an analysis? Do you have like a process? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's a great question, Louis. So, you know, what I am is a doctor. And what I do is see patients in my office. That's my main job. Yes, I've written a dozen books. Yes, I do a lot of stuff, but that's my main job. Yeah. And and so I've learned over 30 years of doing this to how to create sustainable, practical programs to help people get from sick to well mm. very quickly. And what I've done, because not everybody can come see me, and there aren't that many of us out there yet. You only have so many hours in a day. And there's <laughs> so, not that many functional medicine. So I've written books and programs to yes. help people operationalize this in their own life. So eat yes. fat, get thin. And I, look, I'm, you know, you know, I could say, you know, do my program, but I, I'm not, I don't really care what program you do. As right. long as it's based on the basic principles. And there are a lot of my colleagues who are writing great books about this. It's all, yes. it's all the same information because yes. it's all the same science. And if you're telling the truth, it's only, there's only and, yeah. one story here, <laughs> the truth, right? Yeah. And so <laughs> it's the, the, this, this eat fat, get thin is a great program that I put together to make people have, you know, no friction. It's easy. Mm. It's very straightforward. It's, it's 21 pra- days, 21 right? 21 days, practical, goof-proof, and it tells you what to eat. And when you get to the end of that, you'll see how you feel because right. most people in 21 days will change their habits, but they'll also allow their body to reset. It's like putting your body back to its original factory settings, right? Mm. And then if something's left over, then you know, gee, maybe I need to go deeper. Like if you still don't feel great, maybe you have Lyme disease. Maybe you have heavy right. metal poisoning. Maybe your thyroid's not working. Maybe you have a parasite. Maybe, you know, like you could be eating the perfect diet but still feel bad. So do but, the 21 days first. Yeah, but most 80% of the time, you're going to cure yeah, yourself. 80%, I mean, 80% of the time, this works for people. And then the 20% who have to get extra help, they need to come see somebody. And the body's pretty incredible in how it can heal itself very quickly once you change habits, right? Unbelievable. We, we did the survey of 1,000 people who did this. I mean, they lost weight, yes. And they lost inches, yes. And right. they, it's all that's all impressive. And their blood sugar dropped 20 points and their blood pressure 10 points. But the thing that really matters to me is I have everybody fill out what, what I call the FLC quiz. You know what that is? No. That's when you feel like crap. Okay. So it's a quiz. How do you, how, like, you know, do you have your bloating? Do you have asthma? Do you have headaches? Can you sleep? Like joint pain, muscle pain? What's your mood? Are you depressed? Like, so you fill this whole score and zero to four for every symptom mm-hmm. and you get a score. They do one before and after. And uh, the before and after score, there was a 69% reduction in all symptoms from all diseases. Whoa. Because you don't have to treat everything individually. If you put in the right information, like I said at the beginning of the show, uh-huh. the body knows what to do. Wow. Right? So the information in food is so powerful that if you figure out what to eat, you don't have to worry about how much. You don't have to count fat, grams, carbs, calories, nothing. I don't do that. I don't have time for that. Right, right, right. And I don't want to be on an app all day uh-huh. figuring it out. I just want to know how to get my body to naturally do what it's supposed to do. Sure. Right? If you're off by 100 calories a day, you're going to gain like 50 pounds in 30 years. Right? You can't, you can't do it by willpower. Mm-hmm. You have to use science. And the science of using fat and low glycemic food, like low sugar food, mm. Is is really powerful. It's magical. Right, right. I mean, I notice my own body. I'm like 56, and I notice like young man. You're like fit, healthy, yeah. <laughs> energetic. <laughs> no, well, I I can tell you, I I uh, was always been you know focused on health, but I was the doctor who was trained to eat low fat and to tell my patients to eat low fat, and I did that. And I also ate a lot of things that I thought were healthy, like pasta right. was a health food. Oh, my gosh. Pasta was a health food. I used food. to eat so much pasta. Yeah, health food, right? Low Being fat. Exhausted health all the time. Food. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I, I basically uh, changed that, and I started you know, eating a lot less starch, mm-hmm. a lot less sugar, a lot more fat. And I noticed my body, like without any exercise, I'm like so lean, so fit. Yeah. I'm like, wow, I got a six pack and I need to work out. <laughs> it's like, and it, it's just stunning what happens wow. when you're, when you do, and my brain is clear. I have more yeah. energy. My mood's better. Yeah. I mean, you're, I know, so you're drinking a, like a bulletproof coffee. You know yeah. that it works. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, I started doing, testing uh, some different things at the beginning of this year in January. And uh, the first week I did no sugar. The second week, no sugar, no gluten. Yeah. Third week, no sugar, no gluten, no dairy. Uh, fourth week, no sugar, no gluten, no dairy, m- no meat. That was last week. 
And I was just to see that's what, like, that's what like happened with my body. That's like pulling a Band-Aid off slowly. Yeah. You know, I should have just done it all. Just it's like. better to do it the other way. The way I, <laughs> I, I do with my patients, you, you, you do a, a detox. Basically, you get off everything. At once. You, you feel bad for a couple of days, and then you see how you feel. You feel amazing, yeah. Because one of the rules of fashion. I should have talked to you before this. About what I was thinking. And then you can add things <laughs> back one at a time and see what bothers you. Interesting. So, Because wh- the rule in functional medicine is if you're standing on attack, takes a lot of ass for making it feel better, right? So if, you, if something's bothering you, you have to get rid of the cause. Uh-huh. But if you're standing on two tacks, taking one out doesn't make you 50% better. Very interesting. So if you're, if you're allergic to dairy and gluten, but you just take out gluten, you're not going to feel better. Right. Right? Right. So I did the whole wrong way. Yeah. Oh, well. It was an experiment. <laughs> but the thing what I was going to mention was I started doing <clears throat> uh, Bulletproof in the morning. Yeah. And fasting until 1.30. Yeah, yeah. And not eating after 9.30 or whatever it is at night. And I realized that I wasn't hungry no. in the morning no. when I would do the coffee. And yeah. I would only have like half a cup only. Yeah. And I would be fine until yeah. 1.30, well, 2 o'clock. MCT oil puts you in ketosis, which is medium chain triglycerides. Mm-hmm. It's a super fuel. It comes from coconut, which yeah. is in the coffee. It's what I recommend as part of my Eat Fat Get Thin program. It speeds up your metabolism. Mm-hmm. Even it's your eating, burning fat. Yeah. It actually makes your yeah, metabolism work faster and burn more calories. If someone is above 60 or 70 right now and they're listening to this and they've been... Maybe they haven't been well with their diet or they're working out at yeah. all. They're just kind of like living and little obese and have some minor health challenges. What can they be doing right now for yeah. over 60 yeah. to try to live a better, healthier, longer it. life? Well, let's pretend they're not over 60, but we'll, we'll go okay. there. Let's pretend they're 35 mm. or 40 and they're slightly or obese and they have a couple number of health mm-hmm. problems and, you know, they're all in the, you know, because we're all in this together. Yeah. What are we going to tell this person? Here's what I'm going to tell them. I'm going to say, okay, the first thing that we need to focus on is metabolic correction. And we're going to do that by optimizing your protein. So mm-hmm. you are a, you know, what are they? They're, they're probably not eating a ton and, or maybe they're eating a lot of carbohydrates. I'm going to say, well, the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to say, we are going to ideally... And again, they might not do this one gram per pound ideal body weight, which if this person is 150 pounds, it would be 150 grams of protein. That is high, right? That is on the Uh higher end. So this guy might be like, I don't want to do that. I'm going to say, you know what? That's fine. Here's what we're going to do. We are going to focus on metabolic correction. So I am going to start you at three meals a day. I don't care when your first meal is. But that first meal after you are coming out of a fast is the most important. Mm. And you are going to optimize that for dietary protein. Mm, interesting. And the reason it's the most important is because they are catabolic, they are fasting. At that moment, if we get that threshold, that nutrition, that protein threshold right, you will stimulate their muscle. Mm. So what should be eating the first meal of that? So that could be, I would want them to hit 40 to 50 grams of protein. Really? And that could be a whey protein shake, which you could probably get a little bit less. It could be a beef patty. It could be chicken eggs. And eggs. It could be yeah. chicken and eggs. It mm-hmm. could be whatever. Okay, 40, 50 grams of protein your first meal. Just get that right. Just if any of the, if the listener would do that for me. No matter how big or you're, no matter how, how big or, that's right. 40 to 50 grams. If you're 150 pounds or 250 pounds, yeah. just try to get in that Yeah, range. I mean, listen, could it be between 30 and 50? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Between 30 and 50 would be great if you are older. You know, if you are that 60 plus, you know, the muscle goes through a normal physiological mm-hmm. change called anabolic resistance. You want to push their protein a little bit higher. Is if it, you are younger yeah. like you, you could probably get away with 30 to 40 grams of protein. Okay. Do you want to, does it matter if you work out first in it the doesn't morning matter. or I don't fast care. for five hours I don't in care. the morning? It doesn't matter. It Just doesn't your matter. first meal when you eat, when you, after you wake up. Yeah. Whether it's right away or 10 hours later. Right. That first protein. meal should be optimized for protein. Okay. And I would argue that, that if it, that meal is not around training, our target carbohydrate load, and if they're not training, would be 40 grams or less, that mm-hmm. first meal. So you keep the carbohydrates lower that first meal. The reason is, is it ends up being about a one-to-one ratio of, um, you know, if Carbs they want to... Carbs the same or less? Um, or you want it, less? It, could be, it would be less, right? Because... 
anything really above the 50 grams of carbohydrates creates a more robust a, insulin response. Spike, yeah. And you don't want that for your first meal. You want that first meal to be very smooth and stable. Okay. And not only that, and, and Heather Lighty, who I had mentioned earlier, has done some very interesting fMRI research that, you know, one of the things that protein does is it's very satiating. And I always tell patients not to worry about their strengths, but to plan for their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And when you augment willpower by leveraging dietary protein, you plan for it. Mm -hmm. You're much less likely to overeat. Right. So you nail that 40 grams of protein first, maybe a little bit lower carbs and some, and some fat. Then that next meal is maybe four or five hours later, right? So you stimulate muscle. You now have robustly stimulated muscle. That next meal will be another, again, Depending on what you need, I like to target around 30 grams at a minimum. Protein. Yeah. Okay. The data, you know, it's interesting. So a, a lot of the literature doesn't actually support much discussion on that lunch meal. It's really that first meal. And then, but again, if we're talking about maintaining healthy skeletal muscle, we're also talking about maintaining blood sugar, right? Compliance is really important. Mm -hmm. Protein, it's very hard to store protein as fat. There, it there's a high thermic effect of food, meaning it takes more energy to utilize it. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason I believe is because it stimulates muscle. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it takes anywhere from 20% of the food that you eat, right, to actually, it takes 20% of that energy. Right. So if you're eating 100 calories of protein, you know, uh, there is some contribution sure, to sure. that. Gotcha. Then that last meal of the day, I would say I would make that more robust. Again, that 40 to 50 grams. And any listener could do this. The younger you are, you can, you know, muscle is typically healthier. You can get away with a little bit less. The mm. older you are, the more protein you need at once to overcome anabolic resistance. You know, skeletal muscle is fascinating in case you were wondering what I really thought about <laughs> it. It's actually a nutrient sensor. It's, it senses our nutrients mm. and it senses leucine. Senses and that what? leucine, which is that a branch, okay, which is yes. that amino acid. And that's really how we need to think about protein is, is we really need to understand that protein requirement as we age is really about a meal threshold. Mm -hmm. 24-hour protein is very important. Secondarily, having protein in discrete meals is incredibly valuable. Because if you don't, you won't stimulate your tissue. Sure. And as you age, that tissue becomes more marbled with fat. You know, it, it becomes more challenging. The other thing is resistance exercise is another way to stimulate tissue. And this is where you get with a great trainer. Mm -hmm. I know I typically recommend between three and four sessions of resistance exercise a week. But again, having someone evaluate you as it relates to training. And then another thing that's, that's overlooked is mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And that's really the cardiovascular aspect. And the current recommendation is 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity now. And I think as, you know, again, we're very split. People are really into resistance training or they're really into cardio mm -hmm. but when we think about longevity we must address both is cardio when i think of cardio i think more about people trying to lose weight right that's not a great strategy is it helping you build muscle when you <laughs> are really. just running and riding a bike i mean not really i mean muscle to grow requires metabolic Resistance. stress requires yeah. Uh, heavier mechanical lifting. tension yeah. exactly metabolic stress ribosomal biogenesis protein and calories then why do people focus so much on cardio? Is it for heart health? Is it for other yes, benefits? Yes, I believe that number one, it's very easy to do. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have advanced knowledge right. of training Machines protocol. And, equipment and or, that's hard. That's right. hard for people. There is that barrier to entry. Um, cardiovascular, a lot of the literature, a lot of the data has always been done on cardio. Again, because it's easy, you, know, you first use rodent models, then you transition to humans. Um, but cardiovascular activity is very valuable as it relates to mitochondrial function, mm. as it relates to energy, and there's a natural decline as we age. Again, aging doesn't get easier, sure. but being able to be strong and capable and optimizing for dietary protein will be the ultimate in longevity. Yeah. 
And there's so much confusion about the narrative that my fear is, you know, when mm. you address it in your later life, you're missing this huge opportunity midlife. Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, they don't develop later in life. They start in your 30s. Mm. When I was looking at that participant's brain, when I was looking, we'll just call her Sarah, when I was looking at Sarah's brain, it didn't start then. It started in her 30s. From nutrition or yes. from, wow. from excess, from being overweight. Mm -hmm. You know, had she built muscle, it would have been a metabolic buffer. Right. It, it, you know, when you look at diseases of aging, it's not the aging. These diseases like Alzheimer's, cardiovascular, these start in your 30s. Sarcopenia, which is the big one where, you know, sarcopenia is loss of muscle mass and function, you know, which is we see people get much smaller. Mm -hmm. That doesn't start then. Right. It starts much earlier. So if you eat the way that you did in your 20s, you have no chance of protecting your muscle. The changes will be subtle until one day they're not. Mm-hmm. You just start shrinking and getting weaker. And you have increase in adipose tissue. You now fall into the general category of one of the millions that are overweight, mm -hmm. have high blood sugar, insulin resistance, you name it. And it's, it's something that happens over time. And if we continue the conversation that is very distracted, about, well, we'll take this and we'll take this and we'll do that, as opposed to do the foundational things that we have direct control over, which is train hard, mm -hmm. optimize and prioritize for a protein forward plan. You do those fundamental things, everything else is gravy. That's it. So if you focus on protein and you train, Consistently, yes, you should be able to protect your muscle, and, and, and it sounds like eliminate a lot of the health problems or risks that could come your way. This is the ultimate in a muscle-centric approach. My father had a um, lung cancer back in two thousand five. He survived, but he shrunk in size by one third. His, his body, yeah, yeah, and his quality of life never recovered to this mm. extent. So well, this is where my Passion for longevity started. You start. want to live was, longer and more quality. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that's number one. One, two, um, <laughs> I call it don't die stupid or don't do stupid things. Uh, or scientifically, I call it passive longevity, right? So if you're smoking, statistically, you're going to live 10 years, uh, well, less, right? <laughs> and, and if you look at the average for your uh, gender and population group. Okay, so smoking minus 10 years from your life. Uh, not using seat belts, uh, minus what? two years. Seat belts in the car. Seat belts. Yeah, seat belts, yep. yeah. Yep. Minus two years uh, from your life. Uh, well, excessive consumption of drugs and alcohol. I don't even have the figures, but um, that's uh, dangerous as well. Um, so this, these are the simple things. Or don't doing, you know, doing super extreme sports. Like, for, for example, I... I've been blessed and I had an opportunity to travel to like South Pole and North Pole because it's it's still pretty safe trips. But then I thought, okay, it, what if I I want to go to Everest, like the, the highest mountain on yeah. Earth? So probability of death, if you try to do it, is a little bit around, well, a little bit above 6%. Wow. So I thought like, as a man who wants to change one billion lives and father of four kids, I don't want to do it. So these are the simple choices. And, and again, they all rational uh, in regards to smoking or your safety procedures, uh, etc. So that's mm -hmm. that's very important too. And okay. people really underestimate that. Don't die stupid. Don't do things so extreme that it gives you more chance yeah. of dying younger. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, number three. So third is diet. So one of our limiting beliefs, and this is what has changed for us, is we underestimate the power of food. And the food, uh, and, and the fact that food can be our medicine, right? Mm -hmm. So in this regard, there's so many disagreements in, in, uh, in uh, scientific circles around what actually extends our life today. But there is almost one agreement, even this most skeptical one say that, if you decrease the, the number of calories, your, your caloric intake, it's almost, it's almost your guarantee that you're going to live like two, three, four years longer. 
and the quality is actually going to be better. Crazy. Yeah, it is. You'll so, look younger too. Yeah, 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 exactly. But then the question is how you do it, right? Because you don't want it's for me, it's a nightmare just to three days a week, uh, sorry, three times a day, seven days a week, just to control like the number of calories that you do. So what I do, I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of plant-based food because the calorie intensity so of small. vegetables is so small. Even if, you have, if we, even if we have like the whole table full of uh, vegetables, you're still gonna be fine. So that's one. Uh, two, because of the current production practices for meat and mm -hmm. fish, uh, the industrial version of this is full of uh, growth hormones, antibiotics, E. coli bacteria, etc. So I'm just trying to avoid this. Uh, so that's uh, important as well. And this is why you switch to vegetables as well. I, I also do fasting, but it's not for everyone. I, I, you know, yeah. I do like 36 hours of fasting every week, Monday evening to Wednesday morning. I've been starting to do that from Sunday evening mm -hmm. to Tuesday morning. Yeah. And I feel great. It's amazing. I just did this a couple days ago. Yeah. I've done it a few times this yeah. year. And I'm kind of like, okay, once a month right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. just try for 24 yeah. to 36 yeah. hours. Yeah. And it's like maybe every two weeks or maybe every week eventually. Yeah. And I feel like I'm getting leaner. I feel yeah. like healthier, younger, all yeah. those things. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's exactly. I also like your choice of uh, weekdays because I'm. I'm I'm kind of trying, I'm killing the blue monster in the beginning, yeah. right? So I'm like the most difficult part is like do it on Monday and Tuesday and then for the rest of the week. Yeah, enjoy. You enjoy <laughs> yourself, yeah. I also like wine, but uh, specifically Californian one, but um, it's really unhealthy, specifically from the age of like 45, when your aging processes are, uh, are starting to uh, progress. So I, I'm sticking like probably one or two glasses of wine every week. Like on uh, my scene day is like Friday evening or Saturday evening. Max. And that's it, yeah. I just did a brain scan with Dr. Dan Daniel Amen. Yeah, Do you of know course. Yeah, Amen no, I interviewed him for yeah. the book. Amazing guy. I yeah. just just got my results back mm -hmm. literally last week and did yeah. three brain scans. I'm supposed to go back in four months. He wants me to give me, he's giving me some supplements and mm -hmm. some hyperbolic hyperbolic chamber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did yeah. my first one yesterday. I'm doing another one tomorrow. I'm supposed to do 40 with sessions. Oxygen? Uh, yeah, it's at Next Health here. Yeah, yeah. And in the chamber. Um, and he said, that I asked him, I go, we just had an interview come mm -hmm. out with him, but I asked him, of smoking marijuana, cigarettes, or alcohol, which one is worse for the brain? Yeah. And he said marijuana, based on 80,000, I think, mm -hmm. scan mm -hmm. results, yeah. those that yeah. had marijuana had yeah. far worse brains than looking brains than those who didn't. He said, obviously, smoking and alcohol also affected, but marijuana is the worst. Mm -hmm. And so if we know these things, that smoking, alcohol, marijuana is bad for the brain, bad yeah. for long, longevity, yeah. why do we keep doing them? Why do we keep doing it? Look, it's a trillion dollar question. I, I can guess uh, that uh, I, I do think uh, through evolution, we didn't really have access to all these things. So our body and our mind has never been prepared to tackle the challenge of this kind of over availability of this uh, of this world these things yeah of the world right yeah. the the so much stimulation mm -hmm. so much opportunities yeah. challenges yeah. adversity yeah. pain yeah. suffering media like it was a much simpler life 100 years ago exactly exactly there was still adversity but it was like okay we're just hanging out with a few friends in the yeah, yeah. in the farm yeah. right it's yeah like, that's it yeah i agree and uh We've never been, well, that's why I, I talk about discipline and that you need in longevity because otherwise um, your body through centuries, through, actually through million years of evolution has not really been prepared to, to handle all this stress and all these choices. Wow. That's, that's probably the shortest okay. way to answer that. Okay, so, so that's diet, diet And also the final, you know. That was three, right? Yeah, yeah, Summer four? Uh, yeah final piece on the diet is, uh -huh. is the importance of like take out the sugar drinks so like we're drinking water today yes. so that's super important um, this we have way too much sugar that we should and we can process in terms of um, how our body works the fourth is physical activity mm -hmm. and we have a funny uh, view on on physical activity so I mean, as humans, we, everything is like black and white. It's everything is binary extremes. So it's as a group of people just uh, sitting and like watching football on, on TV. The other group of people are okay. I need to run a marathon. Yeah. But there's so many things in between. Like the easiest thing you you can do is just like wear your whoop or 
a Fitbit or Apple Watch and count the steps. 10,000 steps a day is enough actually to, uh, to transform your metabolic state, right? To support your longevity, like a healthy state of your body. If you look at, uh, at uh, science, starting from 6.5 thousand steps or 7 thousand steps is actually enough then it's a plateau but you usually say like 10 thousand steps a day because we tend to under deliver yeah in terms of our target and it's it's very easy it's it's gamified you can have immediate feedback like a batches congratulations prizes and uh that's that's the whole thing i had an interview with um adrian gore the founder of um uh, insurance companies they, they are uh, I don't know who's their partner in the US in the UK it's uh, Vitality UK they started from South Africa and like the only option uh, and and tools and resources they had to make people healthy is uh, lifestyle changes because of the way you know, the country was run and how poor they were like it was like the only thing that they did and they and and they work a lot with guys like Apple with Fitbit just to make a change in, in your health through giving you different stimulus uh, to uh, do physical activity every day mm -hmm. in, in form of steps. So like if you do uh, every week, if you complete your seven goals, you get like a cup of coffee from Starbucks. Every two weeks is, uh, I think, tickets to the cinema. Right, right, right. And then, for, uh, uh, but then the funny thing, you'd be amazed how many things that we can do for free cu uh, cup of coffee right, from right. Starbucks. Like, oh, I'm gonna go do this yeah, for yeah, an yeah. hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's, uh, that's the thing. So gamified, and then obviously on top of that, if you can, you should add stretching. Mm -hmm. You should add um, like a cardio exercise because this mm -hmm. is the best training for your heart and vessels. And remember, it's one of the top, uh, risk uh, for that heart, so then yeah, yeah it's heart cancer, disease yeah. Yeah, and cancer so that's that's super important uh, as well and also heavy lifting Wh what i've what i've heard uh, i've seen the study actually that people who are professional like heavy lifters uh they have zero problem in any stage of their life even during the old stage zero problem with uh joints mm. and bones as well i don't know how it works wow. but it's it's really amazing so that's that's worth that's your uh health uh, yeah everything the, the, i mean yeah. there are some heavy lifter bodybuilders who have destroyed their body yeah, so if you're yeah. an extremist with oh, it yeah, yeah, obviously it's going to shut your body down but i think the science behind this is like the resistance training the heavy lifting is increasing bone density yeah, it's like yeah. it's doing and all these things for your muscle. body yeah. yeah and muscle burns fat so it's like helping you keep the fat yeah. off which is helping you stay younger and all those things so that's physical activity number five yeah number five uh i call it peace of mind and um, as we mm. discuss them, um, every time we, th we think about health, we kind of defer to, and we focus on, on physical health. And I do think we underestimate the importance of the mental aspect of that. Because uh, if we want to live longer, we want to live in healthy and happy state. So that's important. And that's, that's a lot of simple things like uh, sleeping. Uh, my rule is Huge. eight hours in the bed, seven hours of sleep. So that's right, that's right. what I resting for an hour sleeping. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's what I do. Uh, I, you know, I might fall asleep earlier, but then it's just I don't want to mix that. You know, time in the bed is not always your kind of quality sleep time. Um, then uh, meditation mm -hmm. is very important. The problem you just uh, mentioned how difficult and uh, uh, and um, destructing this world is. So. By this means, we have extreme, we all probably have very high uh, level of cortisol, the stress hormone. Yes. And the way Mother Nature constructed our body, it's actually meant to be like a spike. So you see a bear or something dangerous in the forest, you have a spike of cortisol, the stress hormone, you run. And then in, if you're lucky, in uh, you know, 10 or 20 minutes, then you can actually relax and your cortisol level goes down. So, but we live in with extremely high cortisol level, hour by hour, day by day, week by week. And, mm -hmm. it's, it's, and it's very dangerous. So meditation is a, is a really simple way to decrease your cortisol level. And it has uh, enormous um, health effect. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of the happiness, I think the sense of purpose and sharing the best, like social realization, sense of purpose is, is super important. And uh, again, um, 
as we discussed pre-show, uh, uh, if you think about like religious leaders or people who have a big mission in life, they tend to shine more, have more energy, and uh, live longer. So, yeah. so I mean, a meaningful purpose. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, a meaningful purpose. Going back, so those are the five out of the ten yeah. buckets. Um, going back to the psychological age and social, I guess, pressures or social mm -hmm. norms. Yeah. Something my father did as a child growing up is he would never celebrate my birthday. And I remember all the other kids in my class mm -hmm. would have birthday parties, cakes, balloons, presents, yeah. all this. Yeah. It was like this big celebration. My birthday comes around, nothing. I got oh no gifts, God. no parties, no nothing. It was just another day. Oh. And I remember after like a few years of this, you know, once I realized that like five, I was like, oh, I'm not even, and then it was like seven and eight. I was like, Dad, why don't you celebrate my birthday? What's like, do you not love me? You know, I was like, yeah, sad. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, son, we celebrate you every day, but I don't want to put emphasis on your age and how yeah. old you're getting. Yeah. Because I've seen so many people focus on their age and be held back mentally and yeah. emotionally and yeah. physically yeah. by how young they are yeah. or how old they are. Yeah. And so I never celebrated it. And I was like, Dad, but we can still get like a cake or something, you know, and have like presents. But... He was like, I just don't want you to be limited by yeah, your age, by, by focusing yeah. on time as a, a factor that's um, important for you that could hold you back. And I thought it was, you know, after of like the sadness of yeah, it, I was like, yeah. this makes sense. And I it grew is. up feeling just like, it doesn't matter how old I'm getting yeah. biologically, yeah. right? But yeah. psychologically, I'm staying young yeah. and healthy and fulfilled and fun yeah. and joyful. Yeah. I'm expressing myself like a child. And therefore, I feel young, and so, and I never feel like limited because I'm like, oh, I'm now I'm 38 biologically, so it's like uh, I can't do this. It's like no, you can, I can still do whatever yeah. I want. Oh yeah, that's that's a great story. I mean, it's obviously a little bit painful for the kids, <laughs> if I can imagine. Uh, but that's a, that's a great lesson. But and it's kind and of a great yeah, habit. It's breaking yeah. down the social norms of like mm -hmm. how to put emphasis yeah. on our age. Yeah. And how, okay, now you're a big milestone, 30. Now it's yeah. 40. Like, yeah. oh, you're getting over yeah. the hill. It's like saying these things, words have meaning and start to psychologically yeah. affect us. Like now I'm middle-aged. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you only got half your what life left? What does it left? mean? Yeah. So it's all downhill from here. It's like the words we use transform our mindset, exactly. which affects our physiology. Exactly. Exactly. You also touched on a very important topic of how society and our life will change if we're all going to live much, much longer, whether it's 150 years or 200 years as well. And then I think the biggest mindset shift that we need to do is that our life will consist of several beautiful mini lives. Okay. So mini there's lives. mini lives. Seasons. So, yeah. 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 Well, well, that's a great uh, metaphor or way to call it. So then uh, every 10 to 20 years, we will have a, a, an opportunity and the pleasure of changing career, right? Or right. you know, start to do things that you always were dreaming of doing. So that's that. I I do think it's important to recognize, and uh, we always be on this trajectory of redefining ourselves. And 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 I do think it's it's very soon that we'll have an. It's going to be a social norm to make a lot of changes in your life in terms of you know education career per even purpose even a dream uh every 10 to 20 years well that's yeah. that's one of the things to uh, to grow young but also i think it's a necessity in a world where our lifespan will go beyond or well beyond 100 years yeah that's cool i'm curious about environment and weather mm -hmm. how does that play into age and aging or, yeah. ants or staying young? Yeah. Do people that live in cold, extreme yeah. colds yeah. live longer? Do mm -hmm. people live in extreme hots? Is it more mild temperature yeah. where they live longer? Do we have any research mm -hmm. around this? Yes, so, and this is very interesting actually. So every time we're talking about extremes, right. it's not really Good. great. Yeah. Either side. Yeah. So if you like right you know, in the middle of Africa, right, and always under the sun, it's not, that great because it what it does it's actually uh, speeds up uh, it, like the aging processes mm, in your, your body skin and everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other the other extreme, if you are like really up north, that then 
the it's, body has it, to work so hard yeah, yeah, to yeah. stay warm. So that's that's one. Well, the other thing is um, you are deprived of sun because it's like six months of yes. you know, what vitamin uh, D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, of um, uh, polar night and six months of polar day, you don't have like a vitamin D, which processed naturally in your body. And and also you usually have certain limitations in terms of your access to nutritional food. Mm -hmm. uh, food is in deficit there in terms of variety and like right. vegetables as well. So you're really far away from you know, your organic farm or yes. wherever you take your vegetables from. So I do think that we all like if you think about US or Europe in a sweet spot of um, w where we can live for to maximize our longevity. I also I, I talk about and uh, about this in the concept called longevity revolution. I do think and I, I, I say there's seven signs of longevity revolution just for communication purposes. And first sign for me is that I, I want you and all of us to watch out how longevity friendly uh, our uh, uh, our environment um, is becoming mm. uh, so like China and India added 10 percent of their timberlands in the last 10 years or driverless they, cars they added what uh, timberlands like, like, like uh, forest area okay. yeah forest oh. area increased right so that's uh, why is that for oxygen is that for uh, nature? yeah well that's that for... the, because I mean I think uh, mm, making sure the world is becoming better right and and fighting global warming is um is on everyone's agenda and and uh you know like these countries they they kind of thought okay if we will increase the you know the timber like a forest land uh that's gonna help to solve a problem the other sign is um like driverless cars so if you are i was about to say if you're driving driverless cars so if you are in a driverless car, your chances to get in severe accidents or die is actually 10 times smaller. If you're not driving the car. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if it's, if, it's drive, yeah, if it's driven by a computer. Is that out there yet? I mean, there's uh, the Tesla well, that I have has yeah, like self-driving, but, we get but in there. still... Yeah, yeah, we yeah. get in there. It's just a matter of in the next... Because, you know, I, I want to prepare all of us, not only for changes that we just discussed for today, but like, you need to stay on longevity bridge. You, in the next five to 10, 15 years, you need to be healthy and happy to so make sure you enjoy the benefit of all these technologies which that's are coming. coming. That's yeah. not too late. So I call it Horizon 2. So we, we will discuss that as well. Yes. But then drive these cars. So that's a natural choice. So you just decrease mortality rate by a factor of 10. Wow. That, isn't that amazing? Or plant-based meat or lab-grown meat. Well, that's well, just another caloric restriction mm. intervention intervention uh, if, if you think so I'm, I'm actually very uh hopeful mm. and positive about the fact that right now we have a choice whether you go for like a usual meat or plant-based meat uh as well mm -hmm. and i'm not religious about being vegan or vegetarian i have plenty of friends who are gonna um uh, uh, have this habit but uh you know obviously all these changes in the environment contributes to right. uh, you know our ability uh, to live longer and mm. enjoy our life. In fact, I'm actually uh, I'm doing a lot of pro bono programs called Longevity at Work with largest corporations on earth. I, I just I, I don't want to use their names. And again, everything I do in longevity is is me sharing the best of me. So I do it for free. But what we do, we create longevity bubbles like a longevity enabling environment in their offices so people use the stairs there's uh, healthy food in canteens and vending machines they all have variables and then week by week you just compare this department with this <laughs> department this state with this state uh, as well they have and and right now you have so many apps for like meditation for sure, like sure. smoking cessation and an annual checkup is is a part of so many health plans so you just need to have like a good focus on that. Yeah. So this is what we do. It's just another way for you to uh, improve your longevity chances to make sure you have, you're surrounded with healthy choices rather than you're not just, you opening out right. your fridge and it's like and alcohol and yeah. chocolate. I, I love all of this, but it's just not really healthy. One thing to keep in mind would be what, what regulates the gut microbiome? One of the major things that regulates the gut microbiome is what I just said, eating a, a diverse ar array of fermentable fiber um, because Give me an example. What's, what's a diverse array? 
So you have blueberries, you have, um, you know, you have nuts, mushrooms, mm -hmm. you have some, you know, dark leafy greens. These have different types of, or, you know, you've got onions and garlic. Those have a different type of fermentable fiber. Um, there's, that should be differentiated from um, non-fermentable fiber, which would be cellulose, broccoli. ligands. Well, just like well, broccoli has fermentable fibers, and, uh -huh. and but yeah, most of like most of the the bulk of fiber in plants is non is is non fermentable. So what that's doing is basically just helping move stuff through the intestines, right? Pushing mm -hmm. it out. The fiber. So that's important. The fiber is pulling it down and cleaning it out. Cleaning and it out, right? And that's also important. But but the fermentable fiber, the stuff that's that can be eaten by this bacteria in our gut. Like that is the good stuff. That's really? what's allowing the bacteria to make short chain fatty acids. What are the top three to five tea foods? I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to simplify for myself. These foods well, that can really develop that. Yeah. What are the, what would there's you, what do you different? Eat? So the thing is different foods have different types and different oh. types feed different types of bacteria. So if you want, you know, like for what, for example, some people want to hear, Oh, well I can supplement with inulin. I can get an, an inulin powder. Inulin is a type of fermentable fiber. You can find it. Um, you can find it in a variety of plants. Uh, I think onions, for example. Um, but, you know, if you only eat inulin, then you're going to be you're going to be basically feeding a certain certain types of bacteria that, that use inulin or so you know that so ferment. It's the variety is what you're looking for. That helps with the diversity, you know, because these bacteria are playing different roles. Uh, so you know, there's. I have been under the assumption that eating the same thing every day is good. It's like eating a clean, like a little bit of chicken, lots of veggies, and eating it pretty much every meal is the right way to go in terms of like my health, nutrients, in terms of like body composition, how I want to look and feel. Is that something that I should be uh, going away from and diversifying what I eat every day? Or well, it sounds like you just said, you said vegetables. That's like a, that's a lot in vegetable. There's a lot of types of vegetables, right? Uh -huh. So it's kind of yeah. nice. Look, I'm just as guilty, like for convenience, I'm busy. Like I know my, my husband gets tired of it, but I'm like the same. It's so much easier to have the same thing. Same thing every day. Meals because I, I find the thing that's healthiest and easiest to make. Um, and, you know, there's days where let's say, you know, I'm not, I'm not working all day. Then I can, I can be more creative and I have more time. But um, generally speaking, it's easier to, to kind of stick to the same thing. But if, it's you, nice. if you were going to, let's say you came up with a, a new company, a product that was a, a meal that you had to have the same meal every day for lunch and dinner and snack. And this would be the, the thing that you could sell to people. What would be included in that meal that you were like, you know what, if you, ha if you don't have the, all the variety and time to make these foods all day, but if you could do this three times a day, you're setting yourself up for a really good immune system and good gut, gut bacteria. The same, act the same meal three times a day or yes, different meals? Same yeah. meal. So I would say oh, basically wow. omega, I would, I would get salmon. I would get wild Alaskan salmon. Um, and, and that's because salmon is one of the best sources of the marine omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, which are extremely important for health and particularly brain health, but even cardiovascular health. I mean, just, there's just been so much emerging ev evidence um, showing that the omega-3 fatty acids are really important for brain health and for, okay. uh, for cardiovascular health. A piece of so that wild caught salmon. That would be yep. my protein. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also lowest in mercury. There's, there's like four micrograms of mercury, or sorry, two micrograms of mercury per four ounces cooked. Um, so that's really low in mercury. Um, and I would and definitely, cooked, cooked or raw fish? Well, actually cooking it even lowers the merc mercury bioavailability even more. So definitely, and raw, you don't want to like, I think there's too much concern with parasites and all yeah, that. So yeah. I would say cook. cooking me. Okay. Number and two, number two, I would say it, I have to. And in fact, I always feel like I'm depriving myself and I'm kind of quoting my mentor here a little bit. If I don't have dark leafy greens with a meal, mm -hmm. literally like every meal, I like to have dark leafy greens and, and what are the top I would say, two or three I would say kale greens? because I would also like to have my sulforaphane and sulforaphane. Um, it, it plays an important role in so many, in, there's just so many, so much evidence that sulforaphane, I think, uh, may be important for longevity. Um, but, so that would be my greens. Kale. And 
the, okay. yeah, I, I'd like maybe sauteed. Sauteed would be good. Um, because it's okay. just, you can't really eat raw kale unless you put so it in hard. a smoothie. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Unless you put it in unless a smoothie. Put, exactly. Which, which I actually do. I drink my smoothie. I have um, blueberries. So maybe I would add the, the avocado. I'd have an avocado and some blueberries, a little, a little cup of blueberries. And that's it for your meal. Yeah, that would be my that would be my. So you'd have wild Alaskan salmon, dark leafy greens, sa- sautéed kale. Uh, you'd have blueberries and some avocado. And an avocado. If you ate those four things every day, multiple times a day, <laughs> that if that's what you could only eat, you feel like it would set you up for a good amount of success. I do. I do. Yes. Well, there's a lot of so in kale. Um, kale is probably one of the best sources of lutein and zeaxanthin, which are what are called carotenoids and carotenoids you're probably familiar with, or you're and people listening or watching this are probably familiar with beta carotene. That's like the probably most famous. That's like the poster child for carotenoids. Um, beta carotene is a carotenoid. Uh, it has antioxidant and activity itself, but it also can be converted into vitamin A. Uh, lutein and zeaxanthine are really interesting because they accumulate in two regions in the rods and cones in the eye. And they're, they've been shown to play an important role in preventing age-related macular degeneration. Mm. But they've also really um, been shown to play an important role in, in the brain. And there's this accumulating evidence that this stuff is accumulating in the brain. And it really hasn't been known why. And, and the reason I say that is because lutein and zeaxanthin, because of their molecular structure, they're really good at basically sequestering singlet, o- singlet oxygen. Um, and, and, and that plays a role in like damaging the eyes, so like when yeah. you're out in, in the sun, exposed to the sun and, you know, cataracts and things like that. Yeah. So that, that plays a role and you're basically eye, eye aging, quote unquote, right? But in the brain, there's no light. So why is this stuff accumulating in the brain? And um, there's just been quite a few studies over the past five years or so, maybe the last seven years, uh, correlating it with cognitive function and um, improved cognitive function and delayed brain aging. So, I, and, the, and there's like studies, you know, correlating plasma levels of lutein and zeaxanthin with, um, in, you know, improved cognitive function. There's been uh, randomized controlled trials supplementing with lutein and zeaxanthin, improving cognitive function in elderly adults. Um, it's always nice to have a randomized controlled trial because that really helps establish causation when you have, you know, these studies looking at associations at the end of the day, it's an association and you never know, it could be mm-hmm. some other factor, right? Playing sure, a role. Sure. But, um, so the lutein and zeaxanthin and kale, you've got, you've got some fiber, um, a little bit of fermentable fiber. You've got the sulforaphane, which um, has been shown to increase. It's been shown in, in, in human studies to increase glutathione um, in plasma and also in the brain, mm. which is amazing. Glutathione is one of the major antioxidant systems in the body and particularly in the brain. And I know we were kind of chatting before, before we got started. Uh, about your former life as a what I didn't realize even existed was this which arena football you called yes. it and it sounds like that TBI could be a, a big thing uh, yeah in, in arena a, lot of, football. a lot of hits in the head that's for sure right well glutathione is one of the major antioxidants in the brain and plays a very important role um, particularly with any injury in the brain mm. so um, sulforaphane increases glutathione it increases the the enzymes that make glutathione and use it and subsequently increases glutathione levels. I saw some, maybe it was another doctor, I'm trying to figure out who said this, that there was some research actually potentially saying that kale was not good for you, that it had some negative side effects as well. I don't know if you've seen that research or if that's just something. There's I'm, no research I've seen on that. I've okay. heard it, um, okay. but it, it, it's just, it's one of those things where people like to talk about potential anti-nutrients and um, one of the what they're calling an anti-nutrient is actually sulforaphane mm-hmm. um, because it can compete with iodine for transport into the thyroid. And, um, but there's been studies, so for human studies where they've loaded up with sulforaphane and there's been no effect on thyroid function. Um, those were short-term, like a week-long studies. There have been long-term studies on animals that, have actually, that actually have hypothyroidism they were given sulforaphane, and believe it or not, actually, they were given broccoli sprouts uh, extract, which um, is one of the best. I hear those are amazing for you. Yes. So broccoli sprouts have like 100 times more sulforaphane than mature broccoli. 
Well, anyway, so my should we point throw some broccoli is, sprouts on top of the kale or the avocado or the apple? The broccoli sprouts actually would, if I could add more, I would absolutely put the broccoli <sighs> sprouts in there. Yes. Okay. Um, but the, but the, the, my point was that the animals that had hypothyroidism, it didn't make their hypothyroidism any worse at all. In fact, it helped uh, the antioxidant status of their thyroid and improved some functions. Wow. So I think it, that doesn't mean, you know, people with hypothyroidism shouldn't be, you know, weary or concerned about consuming too much sulforaphane, particularly if they're not getting iodine. Most people aren't iodine deficient. It's, it's like in salt, you know, most people are eating foods that already have salt in them. Now, um, you know, iodine, so iodine deficiency not, is not a big thing, um, particularly in the United States. But uh, so I would, I would say that, that, that uh, those statements by some people that are mm -hmm. kind of more into the, the camp of don't eat any plants right. um, aren't, aren't really- Not enough um, research on it, yeah. There's not, there may be, you might find one study with one case report with a female who had some crazy funk disease or something mm -hmm. and she was juicing like, you know, un, just ungodly amounts of kale every day where it's like, I mean, okay, like maybe there, maybe you can create a situation. Sure, sure, where, sure. Where, you know, it, There's it not enough research harmful. backing it though, yeah. But yeah, so- I I'm curious about this. You have some great points here. I love your five foods that we should be eating for every meal. Um, now, as a, I'm a 37 year old man, but I've got the, I like to think curiosity and imagination of a seven year old, but I also have the palate of a seven year old and I don't like blueberries. I don't, I don't like avocado. I'm the pickiest eater. I'm probably a pickier eater than your, than your child. And I want to ask you for the picky eaters of the world who don't eat berries and don't like avocado or aren't creative enough to go that far and they're limited in their creative thinking in terms of foods is it better to just have the supplementation the vitamins and supplements that are the exact same nutrients and just take the supplements and vitamins as opposed to the actual food itself or is the organic fresh caught food always better than the the fish oil or the blueberry vitamin what do you think yeah. about that yeah so um i think that that it, there's a huge differences when you're talking about eating a food uh, versus taking a supplement. And I do think, for example, a multivitamin supplement is, is, I take it every day and I think it's great insurance to make sure because, you know, there are 40 essential micronutrients, which are vitamins, minerals, and essential fatty acids and amino acids we have to get from our diet. Um, and they're important for not only helping us, you know, not die, for example, right. you know, scurvy, but also for long-term function, for a the way we age, um, preve mm. preventing insidious damage. But there's also a variety of these compounds we don't know about. You know, there's the fermentable fibers that are feeding the gut microbiome and which are making all these chemicals like little drug factories in our gut that are regulating the immune system. We've got polyphenols like blueberries have been shown, you know, to inc in multiple clinical studies, it's been shown to increase blood flow to the brain and improve cognitive function and memory in both young adolescents um, and older adults. Hmm. Uh, so, and this was, this was due, thought to be due to the anthocyanins and blueberries. And, you know, so there's, you know, food has so many components, probably so many things we haven't even discovered yet. You know, so many compounds that were just, you know, there's this new, new compound that was discovered in dark leafy greens called um, sulfa, sulfa quinol, quinolone or something, which has now been shown to like to have a specific purpose of feeding the gut microbiome, kind of like the fermentable fiber. So it's one of those things where you, you know, food has so much to it. And there's so many, there's so many parts to the story. It's not just about getting the vitamin, right? It's not just about getting that one mineral. Um, so, um, and I will say that uh, in my, when I was a postdoc with Dr. Bruce Ames, um, at the Children's Hospital uh, Oakland Research Institute, uh, there was a, a variety of clinical studies that I was a part of where they, my colleagues had designed this, this nutrient-dense bar that had a variety of vitamins and minerals. It also had DHA, which is one of the marine omega-3 fatty acids found mm -hmm. in fish, and it also had fiber, a fiber matrix. And there was a variety of studies that we were doing in obese and lean individuals. And so it was like the ultimate food bar. It was, it was like, like everything you need in this it meal. Was like the, in a, it was like the micronutrient bar where you were giving the micronutrients, but you were delivering them with a, with a food matrix, Ooh. like fiber, right? Yes. And, and so 
there's all these benefits that were found from this, from this bar that were particularly benefits found in people that were overweight or obese, that we didn't ask them to change their diet. They were eating their same diet, but you give them this bar on top of that and you would have improvements. You would have improvements. <laughs> and in inflammation, in like, you know, um, HDL cholesterol, which is a good type of cholesterol, um, you'd, so you'd have all these improvements. But if you took away the food matrix, if you took away that food matrix and just had the bar without the fiber um, and just the, the micronutrients, some of those benefits would go away. And, so the, but if the you matrix... gave the fiber by itself, the benefits would go away. It was mm. the whole package. It was everything together that was important. So, you wow. know, with that said, um, I do think there is a place for supplementation and, um, you know, particularly with fish oil. Uh, I think fish oil is is one of those supplements that I every day I take it and I think that the, there's just mounting evidence that it's beneficial. I mean, high dose, it has to be in the right dose for some people. And it's, I mean, it's been shown to really lower triglycerides, for example. Mm. But again, there's conflicting studies. And a lot of times when you look at these clinical trials, it all has to do with dose. It has to do with were they taking a statin, mm -hmm. for example, which can sort of mask some of the benefits. You know, there's all sorts of Gosh, things that are so complicated. Complications. It complplicates everything. And then you get all this data and you're like, wait a minute, but yesterday it was not good for you. Today it is I good know, for you. right? How are you supposed to know when there's so much information out there about medical news, about health news, nutrition news, supplement news? How do you know what to trust when there's just so much news out there about what's working and what's not working. I mean, it's hard to know. <laughs> it's, it's hard for, I have to, it's hard for me to kind of sort through it. You know, then you add the list, this layer of genetics that's also complicating, particularly with the randomized controlled trials. Like there's genes that people um, have where they actually need a higher dose of fish oil to have benefits, which mm. is super interesting. There's also genes where people that get omega-3 from the plant source, because there's a plant form, alpha linoleic acid, ALA, that um, for chia seeds or flax seeds or walnuts, they don't convert that ALA into the EPA and DHA very well. And those EPA and DHA are ultimately what are regulating everything that's important for health. So again, you know, you have the genetics that comes into, and this is also the case for, for studies on saturated fat, you know, the genetics plays a role in that as well. So there's all sorts of, there's so many factors when, when, when designing a clinical trial and I think, I think the burden is on the researchers. The researchers have to come to a consensus right. and, and realize, but then, But then a decade later, they may come to a new consensus with new research where it's like, <laughs> yeah. we, we thought, I don't know, leafy greens were healthy, but now it's actually killing you, right? It's like, I don't, not that it's going to happen, but I'm just saying, it seems like over decades, what scientists and researchers think sometimes is accurate, we find later evidence that it may not be 100% true. That, that is true. That is true. But I think, I think when you have overwhelming evidence in, mo in multiple fields and multiple areas, so you have the epidemiological evidence, you have the associative studies, you have the randomized controlled trials where they're, you know, you start and you give someone something and then you measure an endpoint. The, the double have, placebo testing. Everything. Right. And then you have the mechanistic studies where you start to look at how it's happening and you do these animal studies, you know, that together combined the, the whole, mm -hmm. the whole, you know, comprehensive um, literature, I, I would say is, is what really strengthens. Yeah. The okay. matrix of studies. When every, right. When everything starts to come and point <laughs> to that direction. I, I have so many questions. This, this one just came to my mind really quick as I, you know, I live in Los Angeles I'm from Ohio, so being from Ohio, you grow up eating meat and cheese and milk. I remember I lived in a, uh, a dorm. I went to, in eighth grade, I went to a, a private school, boarding school, and I lived in a dorm with a bunch of other kids in middle school. And I actually had a milk dispenser, a five gallon whole milk dispenser, and I would drink that every three days by myself. Five gallons within three days, because I thought milk was good. You're supposed to drink it all day long. So, you know, you drink it before sleep, everything. I have a question about being in L.A. now. Growing up in Ohio, which is all about meat and potatoes, now being in L.A., it's all about being vegan. And everything, <laughs> is, around, everything is around either keto or veganism or paleo or vegan. It's like you're, you're good, you're bad, you're right, you're wrong. There's documentaries that are coming out all the time about veganism, all that stuff. If you had to um, calculate with your – 
wealth of information and knowledge. Who would be healthier, the person who is vegan eating the best foods all day or the meat eater eating the best, healthiest foods all day? Who do you think would have a, a well, healthier- the meat, the meat eater also would be including pla- eating vegetables Including as well, plants right? and vegetables okay. as well. But to so someone they're an omnivore. Yes, they're eating meat, but they're also eating all the other good foods or someone who's eating all the other good foods excluding meat. So Veganism win or processed, so taking out all the processed foods in both oh, camps, right? Both camps, no whole unhealthy foods. whole they're foods, eating. healthy. One is having meat every day, a portion of meat, and one is not having meat. Who is a healthier, happier human being that lives longer? Well, I can tell you I don't know. Um, but we can talk about what the evidence has shown. And I think probably the the strongest evidence to date. Most of this evidence is unfortunately epidemiological because you're never going to get a randomized controlled trial that's 50 years long. You know, I mean, you're just, you're not going to, that's just not going to happen. It's too, it's too expensive and people won't follow the same diet for that long, right? So you, you won't ever have a longevity study. That's a sure. randomized controlled trial. Okay. But looking at the epidemiological studies, um, for a long time, you'd have study after study coming out showing, oh, eating vegetarians have a lower what's called all-cause mortality than non-vegetarians or than an, people that eat animal meat. All-cause mortality means basically dying from all types of diseases that are non-accidental. Diabetes. Right? Cancer, or type of diabetes. Obesity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, heart disease. So, um, so vegetarians die lots less. Of studies, study, lots of studies have shown that. But huh. with the, pro- the problem with epidemiological studies is there's what are called confounding factors. So you have people that are also obese, you have people that are sedentary, you have people that exercise, you have people that smoke, you have, you know, right. so what about all those other things? How do those come into play, yeah, right? Interesting. And so there have now been um, studies, large, large studies that have looked at confounding factors and have found, yes, vegetarians do have lower all-cause mortality, particularly cancer-related mortality than people who eat meat. But when you take all the unhealthy lifestyle factors away. So people that are not obese, don't smoke, that are physically active, and that don't consume excessive alcohol. If they eat meat, they have the same mortality rate as a vegetarian. Mm. But if you take the meat eater and you add one of those in, like obesity, then they're going to have a higher, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, a higher mortality rate than the vegetarian. So basically- Meat has a different amino acid profile, and part of that amino acid profile can activate a, a hormone, a, a, a very important hormone, but it's got sort of, it's like a double-edged sword hormone. It's called IGF-1, insulin growth factor like one. And this hormone is an, an important hormone, like during development, it helps you grow. I mean, it's needed to grow. People that have genetic um, you know, polymorphisms in, in genes that affect that pathway and have less of it have stunted growth. Um, so it's important for growth. It's important for muscle repair. Like you want to, you want IGF one in your muscles to mm-hmm. help repair muscles after, uh, you know, after you, after you injure them or after you exercise, right? That's the type of injury you're. But can't you get that from stress. supplementation from protein or supplements as well? Well, so this is the, this is the bottom line is that the IGF one, um, which is activated by uh, essential amino acids. You know, you've got like leucine, for example, methionine. It also is important for, in the brain for growing new neurons. I'm just telling you the, the importance of it because the problem with IGF-1 is that as we age and we accumulate damage within our cells, um, and, we, and this happens to everyone, um, and you have a cell that, it, let's say a cell gets enough damage, it has a mutation that could potentially become a cancer-causing mutation. The IGF-1 that's around, which, hap- which is around a lot more in meat eaters, mm-hmm. um, it allows a damaged cell to overcome signals in our body that will usually kill it and say, oh, this has got damage. If we don't kill it, it could become cancer. IGF-1 goes, no, 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 grow, keep, mm. keep growing. And so IGF-1- It's a growth one, hormone. It's a growth hormone or stimulus. Exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact- huh. you know, So studies, it's going to grow any cancer or any disease. It's going to allow things to grow more. Yeah. Well, we, we now know enough that you can definitely slow it down. Slow and we've, it down. Yeah. We've had some breakthroughs that, that seem to reverse it as well, though they're still experimental. Um, but we're talking about one day being able to reverse the age of the body 
by 50, 75%. We do that in mice now. Mm. We can cure old age, blindness, and this kind of stuff. But 